It's a particular pleasure to be here today because I know that many of you, like me, are innovators. You like to think about how the world could be and then try and make that happen. Because I'm a technologist, my vehicle for innovation is the technology startup. And over the last 17 years, I've started five different companies and seen a variety of outcomes. By some measures, some of them have done quite well. One of them has shipped more than a billion units, and another one was recently sold for $100 million. But I've also had plenty of failures. And even in the successes, we've had many, many challenges along the way. And there was one particular challenge that I kept encountering again and again till it nearly drove me crazy. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. But let's go back to the beginning. When I was little, our family used to go for long walks every Sunday afternoon. And I used to fall into conversation with my father about the latest advances in science and technology. We used to then think, well, what does that now make possible? What could we now do that wasn't possible before we were innovating? And over the years, I noticed that other people must have been having similar ideas at a similar time, only they did something with those ideas and they actually changed the world. So naturally, the thought grew in the back of my mind, well, what if Dad and I had done something with our ideas? Could we have changed the world as well? And I think that's probably what drove me to become an innovator in later life. So I was lucky enough as a degree to do computer engineering here at this institution. And then I was lucky enough that my first employer was a startup. And I immediately fell in love with the startup culture. The fact that everybody in a startup is absolutely vital and knows they are. And the degree of connectedness in that small startup culture is fantastic. And that if you discover a problem or an opportunity in the morning, you can have addressed it by the afternoon. It's extremely agile. So I worked in startups in Cambridge, in Oxford, and then for most of the 90s in Silicon Valley. And when I came back to the UK, I thought it's about time that I actually tried starting a company myself. How hard can it be, I thought. Well, <laughs> I, I soon discovered that it's very different working in someone else's startup to actually starting a company yourself and being the founder and all the challenges you experience. And my first startup was a failure. It took about three years to fail. I struggled to think of anything I actually got right to begin with, uh, and I had to learn an enormous amount of lessons as I went along. My second company, Antonova, did significantly better, and it's the company that's now shipped billions of antenna systems into smartphones. And then I fell in with a couple of really bright Cambridge graduates who had a fantastic vision, which was that we should be charging our gadgets wirelessly using wireless power. I, I was intrigued by this idea. Uh, and so we started working together. And for several years, we developed the technology to make this possible. Now, Splash Power was formed in 2001. And you can see that even today in 2015, wireless power is only starting to become a mainstream thing with companies like Apple starting to use it. So we were essentially just way, way ahead of the market, probably at least 10 years ahead of the market. And so sadly, Splash Power actually didn't survive to see the market that it helped create uh, happen. But then in 2006, I co-founded a company called AlertMe, where we developed a connected home platform, keeps you in touch with your home using your smartphone. And that powers things like Hive from British Gas, which you may have heard of, the connected heating offering. And it was AlertMe that was sold for $100 million earlier this year. So these glib summaries of, of startups, it's very hard to convey the actual day-to-day -day excitement. Um, there's a lot of gyration in the early days and a lot of uh, setbacks and a lot of pieces of luck that suddenly vault you forwards. It's never boring. But as I started to do more than one startup, I started to notice some recurring themes, some recurring patterns. And there was one in particular which took a while into each startup before I hit it, but I kept hitting the same thing again and again. And it was that I was too early for the market. So what does that mean? I want, to, I want to explore that a bit. Let's think a little bit about what happens when you start a company. Well, you, you have an idea to begin with. That's where it all starts. And it may be that you've spotted a gap in the market, some need of society. Or it may be that you've, you've realized that there's some kind of technological solution that's now possible that wasn't possible before. You can do something you couldn't do before. Or hopefully it's actually both of those. So you've spotted a gap in the market and a way that you might be able to fill it. So you set about innovating. You maybe do some market research to see if people want to buy this thing. You start a company, you build a team, you might raise some money. 
you build a sales and marketing pipeline, you overcome all sorts of obstacles until you've actually got a product that you think fits the market. And then that's when you hit this problem, that you're too early for the market. What do I mean by that? Well, I don't, I, I don't mean it's just a problem of convincing your customers that they should buy your product instead of someone else's. All companies face that problem. It's worse than that. The problem is actually that the market is just not ready for what you're selling. It doesn't actually think it has the problem that you're a solution to, or you're not speaking in the, in the right language for those customers to understand. So a good example of this, I think, is in the early 90s, the mobile phone market. If you were selling mobile phones in the early 90s, your problem wasn't to convince your customers that your solution was better than someone else's. The problem was to convince your customers that they needed a mobile phone at all. It's hard to imagine here in 2015, but in the early 90s, no one had mobile phones. Why would you need one? But clearly, there was a need, and clearly it was filled. So that's what I mean by being too early for the market. So I want to explore this idea a little bit more in the context of a phenomenon that's happening right now called the Internet of Things. It's all about connectedness. I'm sure you've heard of it, and for me, the best explanation of it is that the number of people on the planet is still growing, but only slowly, but the number of connected machines on the planet is growing extremely rapidly at about 25% per year, which means that in every decade, there are 10 times more connected devices than there were in the previous decade. And the cumulative effect of that, which is going to go on for the rest of our lives, I think will be at least as dramatic as the transformation of the web over the last 15 years. But if you're involved in the Internet of Things right now, you're probably very excited by its potential to change the world, but you're probably also very frustrated that it feels like we're all a bit early. The market just hasn't quite happened yet. When we talk about technology change, we often use the S-shaped curve. And the reason for that is very simple. In the early days of a technology market, change happens very slowly. Progress happens very slowly. It's a real struggle for the early players. And then suddenly some inflection point is reached where suddenly change happens very, very quickly. And in the course of perhaps just one or two years, you can go from nobody having ever heard of the thing to everyone having heard of it and, in fact, lots of people using it. So let's explore that with the, uh, in the context of the Internet of Things. But in, in fact, in any market, it's very important, if you think you are too early for, uh, for market, to understand how early. Because if you're just a year or two too early, well, it's probably time to light the rocket boosters and get ready to be a big player in this market. But if, like Splash Power, you find that you're maybe 10 years or more too early for the market, you might need to behave rather differently. So I've thought a lot about whether there is some kind of objecti objective metric that we could use to analyse how, <coughs> how early for the market we are. And I think there is one, and I think it's collaboration. Because if you look at how markets emerge, it's extremely rare that any one company on its own creates a new market. Because markets are ecosystems of people connected together, doing things together, and therefore it requires that collaboration to make that inflection actually happen. So if you look at your market and you don't see collaboration happening, then it's a fair bet that the inflection is still a way off. So right now in the Internet of Things, if a company builds a connected product, then it has to pull together all the pieces of technology that it needs to deliver that connected product. The connected product may work for its customers, but it certainly doesn't work with anything else. Now, we know this as end customers because if you've got five connected products in your home, then you've probably also got five gateway boxes, five cloud services, five apps. Nothing works with anything else. It's clearly not the Internet of Things yet. And it sucks. Well, it sucks actually for the people who are making these things as well as the people who are buying them because they're having to do all of these different things, touch all these pieces of technology that perhaps they're not very good at just in order to deliver a complete solution. So what happens as we move towards that inflection is that some of these companies realize that they actually don't have to do everything. There may actually be other companies out there who are better at doing some of their solution than they are. And so they can outsource that piece to that third party. And the benefit of that is that they can then focus much more on what they really are good at and get even better at it. And there's also a benefit for that third party as well, because they are now getting custom from, from this company and maybe others. They can now focus more on what they're good at and get really, be really uh, much better at it. 
So you can see how that dynamic would lead to a sort of feedback loop which drives us through this inflection until we reach a world where we have a large number of players all very focused on what they're good at or, and all very good at collaborating with each other in a highly connected way. We've clearly gone through that transition with the web and we're going to go through that transition with the Internet of Things. It just hasn't quite happened yet. So bearing in mind that metric, where do I think we are with the Internet of Things right now? Well, I think we're probably just starting to reach the early part of the inflection point because I think we're maybe a couple of years out because you can see definite signs of collaboration. There are lots and lots of people and companies working together to try to make the Internet of Things happen. It hasn't quite borne fruit yet, but I think we're definitely uh, starting to see the inflection. So if you find you're a little bit too early for the market as an innovator, uh, what can you do? Well, I've got a couple of thoughts. And the first is a bit of a cautionary tale. I, I want to use Splash Power as my example, the wireless charging company. When you do any kind of innovation, the market is wherever it is. So in the case of Splash Power, the market was the toothbrush charger. That's the wireless charging that we're all familiar with. And Splash Power had this fantastic vision that we should be able to charge up all our gadgets, our smartphones, our Bluetooth headsets, our tablets and everything, just by throwing them on something that looks like a mouse mat They'd charge regardless of their position or orientation or power needs, and they'd charge as fast as if they were plugged in. It was a very interesting vision. And we worked for many years and spent quite a lot of money developing the technology to actually make that possible. And we succeeded. We actually de delivered and developed technology which could do that. We had large potential customers like Nokia and Motorola saying that this stuff was magic and fantastic. But we just found it very hard to get those big players to leap to our revolutionary vision. It was just too much of a leap for them. And so being innovators, what we did was we went on innovating. Uh, we did innovation upon innovation and strayed into what I call the zone of temptation. <laughs> so, uh, for example, we thought, well, if your tablet has charged on a wireless charging pad, uh, maybe when you're out and about, you could then use that tablet to charge other things back to back, like your smartphone. Wouldn't that be useful? Well, great, that's innovation. But, of course, all this innovation actually made no difference at all to the market, which was still back exactly where it was with tooth toothbrush chargers. So if, if I look back at the companies that I've started that have been successful, the point at which they became successful and started to get traction, and indeed, if I look at the companies I've been involved in which have failed, the thing they failed to do was to cut back the vision uh, to something which the market can understand to offer the market something that maybe is only incrementally better than what the market has right now. And, and at that point, some of the technologists in your company will go, well, what are you doing? You know, this, that's obvious. Any fool could do that. But it, it's actually not obvious to most people. And you need to offer the market something that it can understand and solve an immediate problem that it has right now. So what we should have done in the case of Splash Power was we should have looked at some of the fundamental qualities of wireless charging. For example, that it can make things waterproof because it gets rid of all the connectors. And we could have then addressed a very specific market, for example, the sporting market, which needs things that are waterproof. And we could definitely have carved out a nice little niche which would have helped us survive the 10 or more years until wireless charging became more mainstream. Because I think it does often take at least 10 years. When we, when we encounter new ideas and they explode on the public consciousness and they're in all the tabloids and so on, actually, if you trace back um, to when the original idea was had, it's often at least 10 years from that idea to it becoming a mainstream uh, market that everyone recognises. A couple of other thoughts about things you can do if you find you're too early for the market, and they're both co-words, because like connection and collaboration, they're all about working together. The first word is co-creation, and sorry, these are both really ugly words. I didn't create them, uh, but uh, they are words that have been, I think, created over the last 20 years, and I think they both capture really interesting ideas. The first one, co-creation, is about collaborating with your customers. Because you might well be correct about the, the direction of travel of the market, but you're probably wrong about the finer details of exactly what customers want and the order in which they want it. And the only real way to find that out is to actually not just ask them with market research, but actually go and engage with them and give them something to use and, and get their feedback and iterate the minimum viable product approach. And in that way, they can actually help you create the product with their feedback. And they put you in a position where actually you understand the market better than anyone else because you're actually serving it. The second co-word is co-opetition. And this is the idea of collaborating with your competitors 
which might sound a very strange idea because in a mature market, we certainly don't collaborate with our competitors, we compete with them. Uh, a mature market is a zero-sum game where often the only way to get more market share is to steal it from our competitors. But that approach does not work in an early market at all. In an early market, you might have 0.1% of the market and your competitors might have 0.1% of the potential market. If you spend all your time beating them up, well, great, you'll have 0.2% of the potential market. You've clearly missed the big opportunity. And it turns out that actually you and your so-called competition have got a lot in common. Because, for example, if they, any money they spend on marketing will help educate the market who may then well buy from you and vice versa. And also, insofar as there are any obstacles to the market happening, for example, technical standards for interoperability, there's every reason for you to actually collaborate with your competitors to help bring those standards about and help create the market, because it's all about collaboration. It's all about connectivity. It's all about creating an ecosystem. So finally, if you have an idea, uh, I would strongly recommend a startup as a vehicle for getting that idea to market. You'll have a lot of fun, you'll learn a lot, and you might just change the world. But if you find you're a little bit early, don't be surprised like I was time after time. It's actually normal. It's not a lesson to be learnt and avoided if you're an innovator. It's inevitable. If you're not too early for the market, you're not an innovator. So it's just something you need to get used to. Uh, and you need to learn how to survive in that situation, and you need to learn how to thrive in that situation, and you should be able to because, as an innovator, you're perhaps in quite a privileged position because you can see what's going to happen next, and you should be able to use that knowledge to help position you to take advantage of the market as well as to help it happen. But it is important to understand how far away from that inflection point you are. If you're only two years away from it, you behave very differently from if you're 10. So I hope I've given you an objective way that you can try and measure how far away from that inflection point you are, the degree of collaboration that's going on in the market. And I hope I've given you some thoughts about things you can do whilst the market happens. In, indeed, ways to get better connected and to collaborate to make the market happen with your peers. Finally, people sometimes ask me, is there any one secret to a successful startup? And I think if there is, it's the same as the secret of successful comedy. Timing. Thank you very much indeed.